courses I saw on your website is uh, Malcolm the Man and the Time, the course. Yes. What did you find out about Malcolm X that most people didn't know? Well, I would say that probably a lot of people could have known it, but in my examination, when I taught Malcolm X, I taught Malcolm for 11 years, two times a year. And I wanted my students, one of the first questions I asked my students is, I'm teaching this course not just for you to know Malcolm. I say, because if you take my course syllabus, and if you see the DVDs I'm recommending, and if you read the books, you'll know a lot about Malcolm. My question to you is, in this course, at the end, where is the spirit of Malcolm in you? And what are you going to do about that spirit? I, I wasn't teaching Malcolm just to let them know who Malcolm was. There's a lot of ways you could do that, easily. But what about his courage? You know, what, what made him do what he did? What, what was it within Malcolm? And so I did an exercise on the difference between fear and courage so that they would examine exactly where they were. Also, I did a thing on a, in, a, in, a, in another class, observing Malcolm's life, uh, to, to be able to know the difference between um, the zone of development. And I used to talk to them about, you know, you're in school or even a job, and you're working at your job, and you're very comfortable with what you do. You come to work at nine, you leave at five. You're programmed robotically to do your job. You're very happy with that. You make your money, you go, stop off, talk to a few friends, maybe kick back a couple of beers, then you go home with the family. You do that every day for all of your life. You're comfortable. But there's somebody on your job that wants more. And that's the person that your supervisor that's watching all of you work that person, he or she, is the one that they're going to come to and say, listen, there's something that we need to do here. You interested? Yeah, I am. I'll do it. Never done it before. In their doing it, they feel uncomfortable because they're out of their comfort zone. They were comfortable doing that 9 to 5 thing. They knew how to do it. Everything was cool. But now you're being asked to do something that's not part of that 9 to 5 comfort zone. And so now you find yourself uncomfortable. But in that uncomfort, you apply the same genius you had in your comfort zone to your uncomfort and you're able to do the job. You now have moved yourself out of that comfort zone and pushed yourself through uncomfort into another zone. You're the one that's going to become the next supervisor while all those nine to fivers are going to stay there. And then pretty soon, the, uh, the object of this particular class that I do with them on Malcolm, Malcolm was uncomfortable when he was comfortable. And he spent his life pushing himself into zones of uncomfort, mastering it, and then moving on because once he mastered it, he was now comfortable. Now he had to push to another level. So I tried to bring... The, the aspects of Malcolm alive for the students, not to just in a boringly way just know him, be able to spout his speeches and things like that. I wanted you to find that spirit of Malcolm in you. And what are you going to do with that spirit when you find it? You just going to let people just make you go to Popeye? <laughs> okay, because that's not the zone of development right there. That's that comfort zone. After, after 5 o'clock, you say, yeah, baby, I'm going to Popeye. Give me a couple of sandwiches. You want one? Okay, that, that's what you're dealing with there. But that zone of development is going to tell that person, you must be out of your mind. I'm going, I got this place. I know this soul food place. This is to cook chicken better than Popeye's ever could. That's the zone of development. And then you have the, the idea of, of arguing over a Harry Tubman movie. Showing the world how we're still arguing over Harry Tubman. That's not the zone of development. 
We have to get, so what I did with Malcolm was attempt to bring him alive and I used Denzel Washington's interview when they asked him, did you try to channel the spirit of Malcolm when you played him? And he said, no. He said, I wanted to channel the spirit that was in Malcolm so that in my performance, people would see the spirit of Malcolm, but not Malcolm. And that's what I've often thought about Harriet Tubman. Every morning I prayed for the spirit of Harriet Tubman to somehow embrace me. The spirit of them. And the spirit is the same. It's the spirit of change. It's the spirit of revolution. It's, it's, it's the spirit of I'm going to mind my own damn business today because I've got so much business to mind. That's the change. Where does a spirit like Malcolm's come from? Come from it, 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 it has always been here. It will always be here. Everybody's got it, but not everybody refines it. Everybody has it. But it's according to what you do in life and, and Malcolm's experiences and his inquisitiveness from a child. Because remember, the, the, the thing about Malcolm that I think is unfortunate is a lot of folk don't know the impact his mother had on him. Malcolm is presented to us with a mother who is mentally unstable and put in the Kalamazoo Mental Institution. And so our perspective of, of, of his mother is, is one of mental challenge. But you got to know who this woman was and, and what, he, what uh, uh, she actually did for Malcolm. Malcolm was on the road to greatness from very young. See, this is another thing about the autobiography that I think is a little bit taken off course. Malcolm was always intelligent. Malcolm's good friend that he hung out with, that got, he was put in prison for, the, the part that Spike Lee played, said Malcolm was always a master at words. He was always a master at thinking. He just didn't become that when he went to prison. He was always like that. But they tried to make it seem, and by the way, I grew up around pimps and drug pushes. Malcolm was not a pimp. But they try to glorify it. They try to make it bigger. They try to make him exotic. And unfortunately, because of my exposure to so many people that knew Malcolm, including Dr. Betty Shabazz, when she was at Medgar Evers, I was able to see Malcolm as a human being and attempt to bring his human beingness to the classroom and, and not make him a larger than life figure. Malcolm was a brother that was struggling. He was a hustler. He, I can't tell you how many brothers I know just like him. And so, you know, his life, if you look at it for what it really was, it can help students understand who they are. Dr. Clark, my teacher, was also Malcolm's teacher. Dr. Clark told me that he said, because I, you know, I had a lot of respect for Dr. Clark. He was my teacher. He was my Jegna, the master teacher that I would go to with questions in my life. And he recognized that. And he said, look, Booker T, don't put me up on a pedestal because the higher you put me up, the further I'm going to fall when you find out I'm a human being. And I believe he never told me this directly, but I believe in the back of his mind, he always felt that that might have been one of the mistakes that Malcolm made with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was a great man. But he deified him. And when he found out that, when he found out what he found out about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He couldn't handle it. Because when you, put up, when you put somebody up so high and then you find out that they're human, the fall is long. Had, had Malcolm seen his humanity and give him room to make errors in life and do things that were not appropriate and sometimes even hypocritical. He was a human being, but Elijah Muhammad was one of the greatest human beings to live during the 20th century. His wife was one of the greatest women to ever live. Noble Drew Ali, same exact thing. But we get, we get caught up in deifying people because we don't know that we ourselves are deified people. So we're always looking for that savior outside of ourselves as opposed to understanding you are your own savior. And, and I think that's what I try to bring to the classroom about Malcolm. Malcolm was a great man, but he was a human being. You know, even people question when I 
question some of the errors that he made in his life. Malcolm made errors. He was a human being, but when you deify somebody, you don't want to hear that. And if you don't want to hear the errors he made, you are doomed to repeat them. And so in my embracing and understanding and humanizing people, respecting them, but they're human beings and capable of making error. Face it. Get over it. That's how life is. I tell people all the time, they say, man, you know, you need to write your autobiography. Talking to me. I say, I ain't writing my autobiography until I'm too old to care what people think about me. Because I'd have to put things in there that people say, yo, man. See, see, when they see me at a certain age, like I'm in my 80s and 90s, I'm there, that's a crazy old man. But right now they say, lock him up. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a human being. I've done my thing. I've, I've, I've been able to evolve. I may have fell down nine times, but I got up ten. And I think that's what we have to do in life. We're too judgmental about people. And that's what the concept of, of when Jesus said of Mary Magdalene, you know, those of you who are innocent cast the first stone. That's what he meant, the metaphor. I'm speaking of the metaphor of Jesus to Christ with Mary Magdalene uh, and this idea of throwing stones at her because of the life that she lived. Hey, how about you? Are you that clean that you can throw a rock? Everybody drop rocks <laughs> because they knew. Hey, listen, who am I to judge? Me not judge, let's judge I. I'm just trying to get the, the, the thing done. And, and um, so that's what I did with the Malcolm class. I wanted to bring him alive, but not just as a person. I just wanted to have the students find those qualities of Malcolm. Like, the, like for instance, uh, I did a class on in, uh, intellectual ability. And I said there are three types of intellects. You can name them different things, but basically there are three types of intellects. There's a large intellect, there is a ready intellect, and there is a clear and concise intellect. Some people have all three, some people have one, some people have two. Some people have a little bit of all. You can have a large intellect, but you can be a professor or a teacher in class, and you can have a, a lot of information in your head, but after class, people say, what the hell did he say? They don't even understand what you said because you're not clear and concise. There are some people that don't have a large intellect and is not ready, but everything they say is very clear and concise because they know how to put words together in structure of grammar so that they can create an image for you to be able to understand what they're saying. And then a ready intellect is when somebody asks you something, you can bang, hit them hard with it real quick. So some people take time to answer. But when they do answer, they come out with a good answer. But they're just not quick. They take their time in responding. They go inside, think about it, dwell on it, and then they come out with an answer. So the three types of intellects is when you have a lot of information, when you can impart that information clear and concise, and when you can do it very quickly. Those are the three types. And so I, I, I use the example of when Malcolm was in an interview and, it, and an interviewer would ask him a question. Malcolm was so intelligent, so gifted, he was able to see what the third question would be in that line of questioning from the first one. He would answer the third question, which would knock the interviewer into a moment of silence because he didn't know where to go because he didn't get the second answer. He didn't get the second question to Malcolm because Malcolm jumped over, answered the second question, answered the first question, answered the second question and the third question. And the moment that that silence came, Malcolm would say something that the community needed to hear. That's how intelligent Malcolm was. It was a gift. But he had that gift from when he was a child. That just didn't appear when he was in prison. It didn't appear when he became a Muslim. Had there been a Christian minister that brought him that knowledge and wisdom of himself, he would have been a Christian minister, but still as intelligent. It didn't have to do with the religion. Malcolm was just naturally gifted, and whatever he did, that's, that's what would happen. 
that's what I try to get folk. Where is your gift? Where is your intelligence? And how are you going to take the spirit of Malcolm, the courage that he had, the, the, the constant push to perfection, where is that in you? You know, I, you know, I really enjoy um, this type of fellowship with you. And so let me in, encourage you to uh, click on the link below. Uh, this is a, a course outline on the study of Malcolm X Shabazz. Yes, Hotep family, you know, I, you know, I encourage you to uh, uh, look to Amazon for my uh, new book. It's my second book, Spirituality Before Religions. And uh, it, it explores spirituality before religions existed. And it um, goes from the very beginning of time, even before the beginning began, unto what we're experiencing today. So I encourage you to go to Amazon and download Spirituality Before Religions.